Running DOS on a computer that's less than 15 or so years old is fraught with driver issues and so on, and you really aren't going to get a great solution. So here is my best alternative to get your old computer up and running as a DOS gaming machine. Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. Over the past few weeks I've been having a look at resurrecting this old Hewlett Packard PC and I'm making some use of it as a retro um, DOS gaming machine. And in one of my previous tutorials then I fired up FreeDOS and there was a brand new Sound Blaster emulator um, which had been released to try and overcome the sound problems in, in running native DOS on these not retro machines but older machines. Now that didn't work out fantastically well um, and I, I sort of shelved that idea. So really um, what I want to go through in this tutorial today is my, my sort of um, end solution on actually bringing this machine back to life and getting some use out of it rather than it just gathering dust for the next few years under my desk. So I'm going to take you through um, why, why I chose this particular solution and, and what that is. And then we'll go through and I'll show you how to install that on the machine, get everything up and running and make this into an actual re really, really powerful gaming PC um, for, again, all of these older games. So let's get straight into that and let's see what we're doing. So our final objective here is to be able to play DOS games on some older hardware. And we're talking hardware here sort of post um, 2000, 2005. So it's not DOS compatible, but it's got more of the sort of modern style hardware in it. Now, in the previous tutorial, we had a look at using free DOS, which is a free native DOS, which runs on newer hardware. But the end problem with that was that it does need to have some drivers to interface DOS with the actual circuitry. And the real problem here comes when we start to look at both the graphics and especially the audio hardware. And we're really, there isn't a, a real solution to get the native DOS system interfacing with the modern graphics and sound hardware. Now there was a Sound Blaster emulator that came out which tried to bridge this gap, but as we saw in that previous tutorial, and again I'll, I'll put a link to that down in the description, um, it, it, it was a good step forwards but we still don't have a working solution. So my final go at making this PC usable again then is we're going to go a slightly different route. So again, to get our DOS games to run, we need some sort of platform which is going to um, interface the software with our, uh, our, our sort of older hardware. Now I'm going to use an emulator package called DOSBox and we're going to actually use one called DOSBox X um, to, to create the virtual PC that's going to run the games. Now that will then need an operating system to work on top of and the best way for this this older hardware and uh, this particular machine here has got a Core 2 Duo processor in it so we're not looking at um, what would be considered high power in, in modern terms. Um, so I'm going to use a light version of Linux. Uh, Windows, this, this machine will sort of struggle, it, it will run things like Windows 10 and so on, but it will really struggle to get any sort of performance. But working with a light version of Linux, which is designed for low power machines, we're actually going to get quite a sprightly little machine. And running DOSBox on top of that, and of course these old DOS games were designed for um, computers running at sort of like 10, 20 megahertz rather than the gigahertz we have nowadays. So we should get reasonable performance coming out of this system. So let's go through. I will take you through the full installation of Linux, DOSBox, the games, and then how to set it up so that it does boot straight into DOSBox and go from there. So let's get some software and get this machine built up. Now before we start installing the new software, uh, I thought I'd just point out a problem that I had with my setup. I'd been playing around with FreeDOS and I had formatted my hard drive as a DOS hard drive. Now when I booted up um, Linux, 
it didn't recognize the hard drive partitions and I couldn't install it onto that hard drive. So what I had to do was um, reuse the FreeDOS installation USB stick, uh, boot into FreeDOS on that, use the um, partitioning system that goes, that goes along with FreeDOS and just delete the partitions on that hard drive. And at that point, I now have a completely clean hard drive and Linux was very happy with that. So just to point that out, just in case you do come across the same issue. So the first bit of software we're gonna need is a version of Linux. And we need some light distribution. Now there are a range that you can choose from and my particular favorite is this one, Lubuntu. Uh, you, can, you can use really whatever you want on there, um, but this one does seem to work very nicely. So do head across to then lubuntu.me. There is a lubuntu.net, uh, which isn't, hasn't got the up-to-date version. So do make sure you go to the right um, website. Once we get there, you'll see it, it talking about what um, Lubuntu is all about, but we can just simply click on the Get Lubuntu button. Now that will take us through to the main download page. And, and for most of you, um, the current version will be fine. Now, this is a 64-bit only operating system. So if you, um, you will need to have a check of your hardware just to make sure that you are running a 64-bit processor. So my Core 2 Duo that I have in my Hewlett Packard machine is 64-bit, so I can run that one um, fine. Now, I also do want to upgrade my old EPC laptop, and that is actually a 32-bit processor. So to do that, I'm going to have to come down here and go to the previous releases, so they do have the previous releases all still for us to download. And I, and you will need to then jump back to the um, version 18 of the software. So if we come back into there, you'll see there that we now have our 64-bit um, version. And also then we do have a 32-bit version that will then work on my older laptop. So do make sure that you download the correct one for your system. So again, 64-bit PCs will run the latest version. 32-bit PCs, you will have to come back down to version 18 and run that. But after that, everything will be pretty much the same. So these, these um, downloads then will, will download a USB image file that you will need to then burn onto a USB stick using something like Etcher or, or the Raspberry Pi imaging system, and that will create a bootable USB stick. So let's jump across and assume that we have done that, and then I'll show you how to install this onto your PC. So if I use that USB drive then to boot my Hewlett Packard machine, I'll eventually get to the um, live CD menu, and then I can just try the Lubuntu installation. Now that will then boot it up from the USB drive. So at this point here, I'm actually in Lubuntu, but running from that live USB. So to get this onto our hard drive then, you just simply double click on the install Lubuntu icon on the desktop, and that will start the hard disk installation process. Now, if you can have Ethernet or a Wi-Fi adapter plugged into your computer, then that will allow, obviously, the Lubuntu to update itself as it's installing. But if you can't do that, then don't worry, it will all install from the live USB stick. So just follow through the installation options, and eventually you'll pop out the far end with a fully installed version of Lubuntu on your hard drive. Now from this point on, we are going to need access to the internet. So you'll need to um, connect your Lubuntu computer now up to your um, router. Uh, I'm just doing mine using an ethernet cable, and, but if you haven't got that, then obviously you'll need to connect up with Wi-Fi and get that all installed. So at this point then, we can of course just use this as a normal computer. So all of the software that we're going to need, we're just going to use the Lubuntu browser to go off and get hold of that. So now that we have our operating system layer installed, we need to get hold of an emulator to actually drive the DOS games. And we're gonna be using one called DOSBox-X. So this is really an enhanced version of the DOSBox standard, which introduces a menu system to help you configure and control the installation. So in standard DOSBox, you have to edit a number of configuration files to make any changes and attach and detach uh, CD drives and floppy drives and so on. 
But DOSBox X actually allows you to do that through a menu and even allows you to um, hard swap your CD drives and floppy drive images directly from this menu system. So it is a much nicer and easier system to use. So if you head across to dosbox-x.com, you'll get to the main download page. So if we scroll down there, you'll see that we have an installation option for our Linux system, which is going to install using a system called Flatpak. And this is really the um, easiest way to get this on and, and maintained. So first of all, then we're going to have to install Flatpak to get this up and running. So if you now browse across to flatpak.org, then we will get to this page and we just click on the Get Set Up button. That will take you to a list of distributions that we can select from. So Lubuntu is based on Ubuntu. So click on the Ubuntu icon. That then takes you to the installation instructions page. Now we're going to be working with Flatpak using our terminal. So if you read the through the instructions, you'll see that we only need to follow the first part of step one and then step three. So if you simply press Control Alt T on your keyboard, that will open up a terminal window. And we can then simply just copy and paste those two instructions from the web page directly into our terminal. And that will install and set up Flatpak for us. Once that's all completed, we simply need to reboot the machine and we are all set to install DOSBox. So if we now head back to the DOSBox X website, we can click through that link for Flatpak. And again, we'll see there are a couple of terminal commands to actually get that installed. So the first one here, if we take up our terminal, that will install the DOSBox X application. So just let that run through. And once that's finished, we now have DOSBox X installed. So we can use that second command then to actually run the application. So doing that, we should then initiate it and DOSBox X pops up. Now mine, when I first ran it, did have this strange screen glitching going on, um, but we're gonna fix that in a second because we do have a bit of setup to do um, actually in DOSBox itself. So let's go and get that all set up. So once we've got DOSBox installed, um, we can actually use the start menu down here uh, in our game section then to actually activate it. So we don't always have to go into the terminal to uh, run the application. Now, obviously I've got this glitching going on. So that's the first thing I'm gonna have a look at fixing. Um, and what I found, um, I'm not sure why, but this was to do with the aspect ratio setting. So in, in DOSBox X then we have this menu and we can do the configuration by going to the configuration tool. So in DOSBox itself, you would have to go in and edit a text file, the configuration file to change any settings. But we can actually do it all from this menu system. So on mine, I find that if I go into render and if I change my aspect ratio to true, and that really just tries to keep the, the screen, the correct aspect ratio when we go through it. Um, if I do that, I can then resave my configuration file. So any changes I make, if I go through there, I'm going to save and save and restart. That will rewrite my configuration file and hopefully that will have fixed my glitching effect. Uh, and there we have that. Okay, so um, now that we've got a, a stable screen on mine, again, you, you may not have that problem with yours. We can go and now start to fix uh, or set it up just the way we want it. So if I go into main and my configuration tool again, the SDL section covers a lot of the way the screen looks. So um, we're gonna to want to run it in full screen mode whenever we start up. So our full resolution then in full screen mode, um, usually desktop is okay, but if we find that it doesn't work or if we want to just make sure, we can actually tell it what our full screen resolution is. So I'm running this on a 1080p um, monitor. So I can just give it the resolution there. And there are a number of other settings and, and if you look in the documentation, you'll find what those are. But either default or sorry, sorry desktop or, or the actual resolution you're running at should be fine. The other one then that we want to have a look at is this output. So if we come down here, there are a number of different outputs that we can use. And you can see some of them you'll, you'll be aware of, some of them will, will, will not make sense at the moment. Uh, but default then, of course, is what we're in the current uh, value. The ones which um, are, are worth having a look at are um, TTF 
At the moment, you can see that if you look closely at the, the screen here, we've got the proper DOS font at the moment. If you go to TTF, that, that replaces it with a nice modern font. Um, which you may well like, um, but it really does not look like a DOS machine anymore. It, it has a nice sort of um, modern, smoothed um, font in, in place there. Um, OpenGL and OpenGL Pixel Perfect, the PP, um, those are the two really ones which I would tend to work with. Um, so OpenGL PP, uh, that will render the pixels on screen as square pixels, um, which gives it a more modern look, um, but obviously it's not true to the original DOS machine. OpenGL itself gives the true DOS look where the actual pixels are, are actually rectangles. So the screen looks slightly um, non-square, um, but that is the true DOS font. Um, that, so, I'm, so I'm gonna go with the OpenGL. But again, do, do have a play with the other ones there just to see if they, if they work for you. Now, we're gonna have an issue at the second because I've selected full screen on there. If I click on the OK button now, and the OK here for the SDL settings, our, our screen goes into full screen mode. Um, and the problem I have is, of course, I've lost the little buttons down the bottom of the screen here. So if that does happen to you as well, all you gotta do is just drag the top bar up a wee bit and you can get to the save button. And if I click save and then save and restart, we should now find that we have a nice docs, DOS screen. So I'll leave you to have a play around with those various options and just find one that works, works for you. So at the moment I'm in my full screen mode and you can see we have the help screen on, on active there. And it does give you a couple of useful keys that we are gonna need. So to I'm in full screen mode. So to get out of full screen mode, I have to hold down the F12 key and then press F. Because um, obviously I've lost access to my menus at the moment. So if I come back into windowed mode, we now have our, our menus available. Now at the moment, uh, we don't have an actual uh, main drive C attached to our installation. So we're going to have to create that and then attach it onto DOSBox. So if I go into my file manager, all we really need to do is to create a folder on our Linux hard drive and then attach that into DOSBox. So I've created a, a folder on my sort of main user area called DOSBox. I'm going to put all of my DOSBox related things in there. So the first thing then is we need to create a folder. It doesn't have, it can be called whatever you want it to, but I'm calling mine C, because this is going to be my main drive C. And once I've created that folder, it, it really is just a normal folder on my Linux hard drive. And into that, I can then start saving various bits and pieces. So I've created a, a, another folder in there called download. Now, one, one thing you do need to be careful of when you are naming your files and your folders. Obviously, the DOS box will treat this as a DOS hard drive. So you need to make sure that you obey that 8.3 format. So any file names you give, the actual file name needs to be at most eight characters, then your dot, and then a three character extension. So um, if, if you use long file names, um, you, you, you can get away with it in some instances, but it, it just makes everything much more difficult. So just try and stick to that eight character limit. But so I've, created, I've called this download rather than downloads, because obviously downloads takes us to nine characters. And inside there, I've downloaded a few game files. Uh, again, I've just simply used my browser, downloaded them, and they're all sat there waiting to be used. I've also, in my DOSBox area, I have created a couple of other folders. Um, one folder contains um, ISO files. So these are images of, C of, of CDs or DVDs. Um, I'll show you in a second how we can attach those into DOSBox, and DOSBox X is particularly good at doing this. I also then have a, another folder here. Um, DOSBox and DOSBox X are able to attach folders as floppy drives or CD drives. So in this one here, I've got um, Command and Conquer, and I've just got the files that are attached to that particular CD saved in there, and we could then attach this then as a, a CD. 
But really then all I'm doing is inside my DOS box area, I'm creating a folder which is gonna be my hard drive and then some other files out here which will be media that I'm going to plug into my computer in effect. So let's look at this drive C and we'll see if we can actually get that attached as the main drive. So if I go in there, I can see at the top, we can see the path for uh, the Linux path for that drive. So it's our, our, our forward slash home forward slash Bob forward slash DOSBox forward slash C. And that is the folder path for that. And we're going to need to use that when we come into then our DOSBox. So to get that set up, if we go into main and go to our configuration tool, if we go to our autoexec.bat function down here, we can then type in some commands. So these are the commands that are going to come on, be executed when we do our auto exec, or when we boot up, sorry. So we want to do what's known as mounting a drive C. We want that then to be referenced back to that Linux folder. So it's slash home slash bob slash dos box slash C. And that will then mount that folder as our main drive C. We then want to um, change fo um, uh, drive onto drive C so that when our, when our DOS box boots up, it mounts the drive, takes it onto drive C, and we're pretty much then ready to go. So let's OK that, and let's save that, and save and restart. And hopefully that will then connect everything up for us. Okay, so we can see there that it is now mounted drive C. We are on drive C, so if I do a directory command, you can see that we actually are looking at that folder as our drive C. So at this point, DOSBox is ready to play some games. So let's have a look and see what we can do. So we are on drive C, and we're really running a normal DOS machine now. So if I CD into my download folder, and I've, as I said, I've downloaded a few games in here. And again, you need to unzip them um, so that you get the actual game files available for DOS. But um, we, we could play um, Duke Nukem. So if we go into Duke, and then we go Duke 3D, that should start up the game. I've come in there, and that should drop us into Duke 3D. And there we go, we've got our game coming up and running. So again, that's one of the easy games to play where we just downloaded the files and we then just go in and, ru and run that. Um, other games, of course, will have an install folder uh, and that will then install it through there. Um, but a lot of these downloaded ones will work just straight from the files that you download. And of course, the great thing about using this method to get DOSBox running is that we don't have any sound issues. Everything just works. So that game was one of the easy ones where we just simply can download the files, run them from our main drive C and everything just works. Other games of course are a bit more complicated. So let's have a go at something called Command and Conquer. And this is one which, again, which was supplied on CD and it does actually need the CDs plugged into your computer to be able to run the game. It, it checks to see if that CD is actually there and that it is the right CD. But of course we can download the um, ISO files or the disk, disk image files for these games. So if I come back out to um, my, my windowed mode. So remember I created a folder called ISO and inside there I had downloaded a, an ISO which is a, an image of the Command and Conquer CD. So I can actually attach that or in effect virtually plug it into my DOS machine um, straight through the menus in DOSBox X. So again, this doesn't require me to edit any configuration files or, 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 or turn off DOSBox, edit those, reboot and so on. I can just simply do it hot, I can hot swat them. So I can go into my drive menu. I can go to my drive D. So I want to mount this as drive D and I want to mount a disk or CD image file. Again, I can, I can mount floppy drives and everything and in this way. It will then ask me which one I want to use. So I'm going to select my ISO file. OK that. And that file has now, in effect, I've put that into my CD drive bay, plugged it in and we're ready to go. So let's come back out to full screen mode again so we can see what's going on. Okay, so if I go to drive D, I'm now on my CD drive. 
I can do a directory of that, and there's the files from that CD. And if I now do uh, an install, we should get Command and Conquer coming up and starting off. So again, it's it knows that this is the correct um, CD, and it's now taking me through my installation process. So again, I can just run through that, and I should then be able to get the game up and running. So let, let, let me do that, and then we'll come back and just make sure that everything has worked correctly. And there we have Command & Conquer now fully installed, uh, and you can't get to these cutscenes unless you have the correct CD plugged into your computer. So that should now be all up and running. So that really leaves us just one thing left to do to complete our installation of DOSBox X. So at the moment, um, when we start up the computer, it obviously drops straight into Linux uh, and sits there. And we then have to, of course, go into our start menu and start DOSBox. So it'd be quite nice if we could actually get it to automatically run DOSBox as soon as the computer boots up. So let's um, add that into the system. So um, I have got some text on screen here. So this um, command, so that was the command from our DOSBox installation um, page on the DOSBox website. And that's the command that we use in the terminal to run DOSBox. And we're gonna need that now for this startup procedure. So to, to make something start when um, our Ubuntu boots up, we need to go into our, our, into our menu and into our preferences. And we're going to go to the LXQT settings. So LXQT is the Windows Manager for Lubuntu. We want to go into its configuration center. We then want to go into our session settings. And here you'll see that we have an auto start section. So there's a number of things in here which will, will auto start when our Lubuntu starts up. So we want to add a new one into this. So let me just make that just a little bit bigger there. Oh. I can just get a hold of that corner. So I'm doing it through my video capture card, which just makes things a little bit harder. Okay, so we're gonna call this DOSBox X. And that's just so we can recognize which of these startup applications is which. And then in the command area, I'm just gonna copy in that block of um, that, that command. So if I do that and then paste it into there, I don't need to wait for the system tray to become active. I just need that. And that now is everything set up. So if I just close that, it's saying here that those settings won't take effect until the next login. So if I do that, again, the, the, this command, you can find it on the DOSBox X website, um, or, or I will, of course, include it in the um, project page that goes along with this with this um, tutorial. And again, you'll find links to all of those things in the in the description down below. And I say, do, do, do have a look at the, at the project page because we'll have everything that we need to get this project up and running. But once we've got that set then, I should be able to just um, reboot this computer and that should then take me straight into DOSBox. So let's just try that. And let's just go to leave and let's go to reboot. So of course it boots up first into Lubuntu, but as soon as we get um, the basic Lubuntu boot finished, it should then drop us into DOSBox. And there we go. So not quite a true DOS, um, native DOS booting up, but of course it does then get through that whole process, um, drops us straight into DOSBox, and of course we have all those driver issues um, no longer gonna bother us. We will have full sound, full graphics, and we have a very nice system to use. So that's my take on setting up a DOS gaming machine. Uh, one of the good things about this route using um, Linux as your base operating system is of course, although we've set it up as a DOS gaming machine, we do have a Linux computer, which does open us up then to using this for more than just DOS gaming. We can of course jump out of DOS box and then install whatever other emulators we want. So we can put in our Nintendo emulators and, and so on. But that is is my take on the best DOS gaming setup. Um, do, do give me any of your views um, down in the comments below.
I, I hope you have enjoyed this. If, if you do, please do make sure that you like the video and subscribe to my channel. Um, I do cover a lot of these types of tutorials uh, as well as electronics and, and so on. So do make sure you subscribe, hit that notification bell so you get notified when my next videos are released. So hope you've enjoyed this. I look forward to seeing you again in another video very soon and bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.